to formally welcome everyone to the webinar. This week we're going to be looking at how to boost agent productivity and contact center efficiency. Uh, so it's a you know, fascinating uh, topic there and there's many ways of, uh, of measuring that uh, and we'll be looking at that in a short while. So uh, delighted to introduce back to you uh, Martin Jukes for, uh, it's probably been about 18 months since you've been on our, on our webinar program so we're delighted to be able to uh, uh, get a slot back in your uh, back in your diary so w welcome back and you're going to be looking at uh, productivity and efficiency in a sort of a, a different way from the classic work harder approach I hope so yes I hope I'm um, able to bring something new although some of it may just be reinforcing things that people forget because uh, working in contact centers is a very busy life as you know indeed and welcome to Graham Gilovitz from Jakarta this is your first webinar uh, with us that we've number, done a number with Jakarta over the over the years. So welcome. You're going to be looking at the role that technology plays in the uh, in how. To yeah, ab product. absolutely. Uh, there's one thing that you can do more on the one to one and the personal side, working with your agents, but it really needs to be coupled with technology to really drive home uh, those greater efficiencies. As you said earlier, we, you know, it, it doesn't matter what your your MPS or your CSAT scores are. There's always more that you can obtain especially when the war really now is on the customer service side. So we'll try and uh, touch on a few of the technologies people should be looking at uh, evaluating in the next uh, few months. Excellent. Well, if you want to uh, watch a replay, and I know a number of uh, you do like to share these with your management team, particularly on productivity and efficiency and how to, uh, how to look at that could be quite valuable. That's going to be available later on this afternoon, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. Um, uh, we're going to be carrying on the discussion this week in our chat room as ever, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, just fill in your first name, last name, and email. And uh, quite useful if you um, put the uh, windows up side by side, perhaps the chat room on one side, the webinar screen on the other. And uh, just uh, you, an added advantage for being in the chat room is you can download the webinar slides. Just follow this link here and you can download Martin and Graham's slide. An added advantage of being in the chat room, as ever, if you want to ask a question, use hashtag question, and we'll put those to our panel of experts, but you can also ask the question of the rest of the audience, and the audience is quite happy to, uh, for us to uh, uh, promote that you uh, answer each other's questions. And uh, hashtag tip for a tip, and uh, you can win either a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates. Here's the uh, a bottle of champagne. We can't keep the chocolates in the office for very long, so we have to ship those uh, straight out from uh, Godiva. Uh, uh, or if it's uh, difficult to ship, then we sometimes send out an uh, Amazon gift card. So uh, really your choice, depending on the, the channel. And uh, we're asking the question in the chat room, is customer satisfaction getting better or worse in your organization? So uh, if you've got an answer to that, just in a few words, is it getting better or worse in your organization. And just while you're uh, typing that in, I'm gonna start off a poll, and that is how do you measure efficiency in your organization? This is select all that apply. Is it average handling time you use? Is it handled on first touch or resolution rates, what used to be called first contact resolution? Uh, is it cost per transaction? Is it looking at things like occupancy or utilization? Or is it looking at things like total sales volume? And if you've got another measure of efficiency that's not on this list, if you'd perhaps like to put that into the chat room, and uh, we'll have a look at some of those in a, in a short while. So let's have a look at the, um, at the results we've got coming in, and I'm just gonna close the poll off. Here we have a sample size of 67, and it um, uh, looks like the, the most uh, popular one here is average handling time as a measure of efficiency, uh, followed by occupancy, uh, followed by the handled on first touch uh, at 39%, 31% say it's total sales volume, and only 22% cost per transaction. Um, surprising number here saying average handling time. Um, Martin, have you seen any difference in that over the years, do you think? I think that a number of organizations um, try and reduce average handling time, and I think it very much depends on the service or the uh, what you're trying to achieve as an organization because I do see in some situations average handling time being cut at the detriment of the contact of the uh, the outcome of that contact 
So uh, it's just something to be aware of, really. A shorter average handling time doesn't necessarily mean it's more efficient. No, indeed. And I think that's uh, some of the things that, Martin, uh, you're going to be talking through in your, uh, in your presentation. Let's just have a quick look at, is customer satisfaction getting better or worse in your organization? Uh, Jane says, uh, oh, that's a question. Let's have a look through. Um, there are a lot of changes and the culture is very diversified. Uh, in a lot of challenges and the, uh, uh, the culture is very diversified. Um, Lisa said we were just able to start to measure customer satisfaction last year, but we've been concentrating heavily on increasing our scores in the email channel uh, specifically, because I know customer satisfaction does vary by, uh, uh, by channel. So uh, Martin, any thoughts on, on customer satisfaction over email? Um, I think that email is, is a, a channel that's probably evolved without a great deal of consideration. So I see lots of people going, uh, having training for their team in how to handle a telephone call, but I don't necessarily see the same level of training as regards emails. So you could, you could make a, an assumption there that um, customer satisfaction may not be as high with emails. Okay, well, that's a pretty also... good, good time to hand across to you, Martin, and uh, you can take us through your your whole thoughts on the uh, whole way to approach uh, uh, efficiency, productivity, and how you keep customer satisfaction up while you're doing that. So, Vili, really, uh, we pass across to you, and uh, if you'd like to um, take us, put your slides up and uh, take us through your presentation. Yes, thank there you, Jonty. Um, hopefully that should be coming up, coming up in a second. We can see your screen, but it's not full screen yet. Okay, there we go. There we go. Excellent. Uh, right, so um, yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry about that. I hope that's not going to keep happening. Um, yes, my name is Martin Jukes. I'm here to talk to you this afternoon about boosting agent productivity and contact center efficiency. And I thought what I'd start with would be uh, having a look at what is agent productivity, because I think people get very confused between productivity and utilization. So I've put a, a little bit of, a, of my definition of what they are. So start, starting with productivity, I believe this is the output from an agent when they are working. So it's what they actually produce in the time that they're working. So this is very much within their control and, and as regards how productive they are at the time when they're engaged in transactions. As regards utilization, I think that's more of a management responsibility to make sure that staff are utilized effectively. And I see utilization as being the amount of time an agent is productive during their working day. So it's quite different, uh, quite, there's a couple of quite significant differences there. I think the theme of what I'm going to talk about today is, is actually a, around um, making sure that you've got the right people with the right skills and the right attitude in, um, in the right place at the right time. So that comes across very much around looking at productivity and, and utilization. So when I first started thinking about, uh, when Jonty first asked me to, to start thinking about today, I, I thought, well, agent productivity, let's just, just go back and see what demotivates agents, which has a significant impact on their, their productivity. So first of all, um, I had a look, and we've, we've sort of been doing work in, in contact centers for, for over 20 years now. I've got a real theme of what people are saying, what advisors are saying. And the number one complaint that I, uh, advisors have that they, they feed back to us is they get frustrated, their inability to deal with customers' inquiries. So it may well be they haven't got the tools to the job or they haven't got the information or the service isn't correct, but they get very frustrated with, uh, with that inability to deal with those inquiries. The second one is having inefficient processes. So this may well be the overall business process or it may well be something about the process for them getting information. But certainly this has a significant impact. And, and again, another cause of major frustration. The third one is poorly performing systems. Um, I'm going to talk about systems a little in a little detail, but uh, Graham's going to talk in more detail later on about that. But from, from my perspective, some of the impact of systems um, poor performance would be manifested in things like poor response times from systems, then being very slow, being unreliable, crashing, and then it moves on to them not having the information or the integration or the, the, the connectivity that they need to be able to be effective. The fourth one is not being listened to. So I believe that uh, advisors are really 
uh, important in terms of service improvement because they have enormous experience of what's going on and how it impacts them. So I think it's really important to be able to listen to them. And advisors have told me frequently that they say uh, they're not being listened to and they raise issues and they're, they're just really ignored and not taken into account. And finally, the lack of feedback. So advisors are people that, and agents are, are people that come to work. They want to try and do a good job. It's important that they know if they're doing a good job or not. Now, for some people, that may well be giving them good feedback. For other people, it may well be giving them some uh, poorer feedback. But it's about how to, to make sure they understand where they are and what's expected of them. So in terms of looking at how to increase productivity, I think there's three, three main areas that can, uh, that can be taken into account. So I think it's enabling the, the agents, supporting the agents, and then managing the agents. So three separate areas that I've broken down to look at in a little bit more detail. If I first of all look at enabling the area, uh, agents, it's about making sure that they've got the right tools to be able to do the job. And tools mean different things to different people. I've given some ideas here. So we're talking about uh, training. So have, are, do they have the right training, first of all, to be able to understand the process? Do they understand the products or the services they're dealing with? Do they understand the technology they're using? And then do they have the right training in terms of the customer service skills that they need to be able to do that job? Do they have the knowledge? Is the knowledge available for them to be able to do their, their job effectively? So we may pick up some knowledge in training, but a lot of knowledge that I talk to is system-based information that they may need to have access to to be able to deal with an inquiry. If they haven't got that, it's a real disabler. Are the processes effective? So again, do the, do the processes really support the frontline staff in dealing with those inquiries? Or do they, are they there to, for the benefit of the organization, the organization's processes? And finally, the systems. Are the systems suitable and adequate? Are they giving the information? Are they performing uh, at the right level, at the right speed? And are they effective in, again, enabling the, the advisor to do their job? The second area is, is supporting the, the, uh, the agent. Uh, a number of areas with, uh, with support. First of all, induction. And, and just by coincidence, I, um, I, I did see an article yesterday, which I, I think I may have posted on uh, social media, around how Disney really felt that they were getting a benefit of giving people uh, uh, their new starters a really thorough induction. And when I read the article, it really bore some truth to me because it talked about how the first part of the induction was very much focused on the brand and what it is that they were trying to deliver as Disney. And I think many organizations don't necessarily provide that support to, to agents. So they're, they're working in, 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 a, in, a, in a vacuum where they're, they're trying to do a job, but they don't understand the bigger picture. One-to-ones, I think one-to-ones are the most important things that team leaders can do to support their, their agents. Um, really, uh, I can't emphasize enough how much I believe that makes a real difference both to the overall performance, but also the individual perception of, uh, of their work. I think the one-to-one -one should really encourage two-way feedback. So it's not just about giving feedback to the, to the agents about their performance, but it's understanding where they're struggling, why they're struggling, and what their recommendations are and change, how they would like to change things in the future. And this starts to involve them in improving the processes and continual improvement um, um, programs. So I think that there's two people that really have a, a big influence or big impact in, in giving that feedback as to how the process is. And that's the customer and then the frontline agent. So we do see quite a lot of organizations that involve customers, spend a lot of time and effort talking to customers, but they don't talk to their own people to understand what's happening at the front line. And finally, the encouragement. So I think it's, it's really important to be able to encourage agents and advisors in terms of motivating them, rewarding them for good behavior, good performance, and generally making it an environment that's uh, encouraging for them to do a good job. The third element that I, I want to focus on is, is management. And the first, uh, the, again, this breaks down into three different areas. The first is measuring. So measuring performance, measuring productivity. So this may well be looking at the, 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 the examples of, uh, of the, the, uh, the poll today, um, about which people use uh, most effectively to, to measure efficiency. I've listed a couple there. But I think it's also important to measure the quality of service as well as the quantity. Measuring the quantity in, in isolation doesn't necessarily give you good productivity or good efficiency because without the right outcome or the right output, it may be very inefficient or unproductive. 
Finally, measuring is, uh, is really helpful in terms of identifying trends. So if we're looking at an individual agent, are they having a bad day? Is it a slow week? Are they struggling with something? Or is it part of a much bigger problem where they need some extra support or training or, or whatever? The second area is sharing. So most people measure, some people share. Um, so it's about communicating performance, both at an individual level to individual uh, agents, but also at a team level, so that the whole team can see where their performance is and they feel part of, of that team and responsible for that service, start to own the performance. So where I said most people measure, some people share. The third area is where the majority of people that I come across really struggle, which is in acting. So they don't know how to intervene and manage when they see poor performance. And I think it's really important for, for agents to have that um, intervention so that they know at an early stage where they're performing poorly. It's about using the data. So there's lots of data available, but it needs to be used and used as evidence um, to be able to inform and, and present this uh, situation to the agent. And then it's about developing improvement plans. So what do we need to do to relieve this pressure? What do we need to do to improve your performance? Moving on to improving contact center efficiency. Well, what does efficiency mean to you? That's the first question I'd normally ask. And how do you measure it? So again, we talked about a few different areas of measure that could be, that could be used. Uh, all very relevant, all fit. So we've got some there in terms of the utilization, first contact resolution, et cetera. Um, all, all are valid. But what I would remind people about is that targets drive behaviors. So it's making sure what's, uh, you, you understand what's important for your organization. So I would use an example of, of doing a comparison between a sales organization, a sales contact center, and a customer service center, where sales, the important things may well be the amount of revenue or income that you can generate, whereas customer service may well be resolving issues to the customer's satisfaction. I think it's important to be able to determine the measures and understand the context that they're being applied in. So going back to those that we looked at on the previous slide, looking at those, are they appropriate to you? And if they are, what do they need to balance against? In terms of how to improve efficiency, well, I think there's a number of management information tools available. Some are easier to use than others, but most contact centers now have a basic level of information. Real-time management is really important. It's about being aware of what's happening now. I think for many people that I come across, they, they have a look and they look, back, uh, look at nine o'clock in the morning at yesterday's performance, and it's just too late then. They can't change it. If you're looking at management information in real time, you can see what's happening at two o'clock, and you can perhaps fix it by quarter past two. Adherence to schedules is, is, is and I talk here about the little things that make a difference. Um, I would refer to something called the, the power of one, which I think Dante would, uh, would, has told me was on a very early webinar. Uh, it's about making sure that people log on when they're supposed to log on, log off when they're supposed to log off, and operate to the shift plan that's put in place. So people spend a lot of time managing uh, uh, shift patterns, making sure that they're, they're in the right, got people at the right place, but then they don't necessarily manage people in terms of making sure they adhere to those schedules. And one of the things that we do when we go to look at a poorly performing contact center, one of the first things we do is sit down and look at real time information and see which people are adhering to schedule, which ones aren't, which people are uh, performing well, which ones aren't, and exactly getting a good feel of what's going on. And normally we're able to make huge differences from doing that. It's about and what we'll do, Graham, is we'll put a link to the uh, Power of One webinar in the, uh, in the chat room and we'll put it on the uh, post webinar page as well. Okay, thanks, Chanti. Uh, so I, I believe it's about uh, efficiency is about active management, which is both being proactive uh, and reactive. So looking forwards, but also looking at the now and combining the two. Finally, the most important point, and I will repeat this on numerous occasions, is about understanding the detail, looking at the data and getting to understand it. For some people, looking at the data initially for the first time can be quite confusing. It's about getting to understand what it really means and what it really what it's really saying to you. And I would I would add a word of warning there. It doesn't always say. It's not always saying what it appears on the first uh, first viewing. It's about looking at the detail, and understanding it. 
I think the major thrust of what I would say in terms of efficiency is aligning the resources to, to the demands, to the customer demand. So when a customer is contacting you, and uh, what time, what day, and how many, how much resource do you need to, to be able to manage that? So I've, I've just given a, a sample chart there of, of a typical uh, call demand profile. Um, we tend to use the term call demand because that's where it originated from, but the demand still exists and you have a similar profile for chat or for email, although with email it may be less demanding in terms of the, uh, the response times for it. But it's about looking at that detail and making sure you understand it and tracking it as it changes. So for some clients, we go in and do this on an annual basis, and every time it's, it's changed a little bit. Nobody, you know, well, I talk to clients about why that's changed, and they're not really aware of it, which is a little disappointing. But I'd like to sort of see companies, uh, our clients sort of looking a little bit more detail at what, what the changes are and why they're changing. It's about analyzing historical information and identifying trends as to be able to predict and forecast future trends. So what's happened in the past? Uh, in the past, Are we a seasonal organization? Do we have seasonal shifts? Uh, and what's going to happen in, in, in the future? And then being able to predict what the demand will be and be able to then improve the efficiency of making sure you're matched. Once again, it's all about understanding the detail. I then start thinking about multiple channels and how organizations now, the majority of organizations offer service or sales across multiple channels. I've just listed four there as, as an initial example. And the point I want to try and make is that it's obviously going to be more efficient to train staff, not all staff, but some staff in multiple channels and then being able to blend them across those channels. So it may well be that at quiet times for the telephone, people can be picking up email work. It may well be that chats increase at a different time of the telephone calls. But being able to blend the different interactions across the different channels is definitely going to be more efficient. I think, again, looking at individual agents, a productive agent really does have an impact on efficiency, really does support efficiency. Talked a little bit about processes. Uh, I think it's important to look at look at processes in, in detail because inefficient processes are real high high cost of the business and frustrating for, for both uh, frontline staff and customers. So I would recommend having a look at the most infrequent inquiry types and mapping them out and then taking a look and saying uh, with a real critical eye, are they efficient? Could they be automated? Is there a self-service opportunity? Is there a better way? Do we need to do it like this? And if so, why do we need to do it like this? Doing that analysis really does start to sharpen the focus and reducing process time uh, can make a big difference with regards to efficiency. But I also think that as well as the time scales, we need to focus on quality. So quality, poor quality is also really inefficient. I just want to focus a little bit on uh, customer experience because I'm just showing a picture there of a, an academic journal that was compiled a number of years ago. Um, but it's still very relevant to today's age. It talked about customer experience and the links with profitability. Well, profitability really comes about through efficiency. Uh, and this academic journal, which was undertaken at the university in, in England some years ago, talked about how there was a, a definite link between improving the customer experience and improving profitability as in efficiency. And the reason it does that is because empathic transactions are more efficient because they increase the trust between the customer and the organization. They build the relationship. They help to get to the issues faster. So a customer that trusts you will tell you more. Uh, it increases first time resolution and it increases loyalty. So customers will come back and they'll come back and they'll come back, which is what you particularly want in a sales environment and in customer service environments. So I hope that gives you a little bit uh, of something to, to think about. Um, there's obviously lots more information that we could have talked about, but uh, trying to keep it quite brief. In summary, I would say let's focus on the detail, understand the detail and understand whether we're efficient and if not, why we're inefficient. Use the data, lots of data available. It may not be perfect, but it's, it's a good starting point. It has to be the right starting point. Start with the facts. Enable, support, and manage your agents and really help them to be more productive. Think carefully about targets because they can impact negatively on efficiency. So if I talked about average handling time again, trying to reduce that can actually be uh, 
have a negative consequence. Productivity is about the outcomes and the out and, and output. So it's not just about how much we can do, it's about what the output and the outcomes of those interactions are. Having poor, poor outcomes, poor outputs is just inefficient. And finally, don't forget the quality, because the quality is what really makes the difference to customers. Well, thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Martin. I think some uh, great uh, food for thought in there. Uh, certainly a few points in there I, I think are very uh, valid. Uh, agents get very frustrated if they can't answer a customer query, so you need to look at uh, what may ho be holding that back. I think there's some very good points about making feedback into a two-way process. We involve uh, frontline advisors uh, in problem solving, and I think a very good point there about good empathy does increase efficiency. Some so, some great things there. Uh, great things there. We're going to jump down onto a poll, and uh, it's one of the points that. Uh, Martin uh, looked at. And uh, just want to ask the question of the audience, is a shorter interaction more efficient? So it is, a, is a shorter phone call more efficient than a longer call? If you just like to uh, put your answers in there. Uh, so the answer is very simple, yes, no, or maybe. So just have a look in, <clears throat> in here. It'd be quite interesting to, to see the results. And um, particularly in view of, I think, 73% of people are looking at average handling time uh, as a measure of efficiency. So we'll just share the, uh, share the results here. And I think this is a, I, mm. not surprised perhaps by the number of maybes, but I think I'm quite surprised that 25% have said no and only 9% have said yes. Graham, this almost points to, to sort of a measure like average handling time as being the wrong one to look at. I have to agree with that, and it's something that was a bit of a misnomer, in my opinion, is that everyone thought that self-service... Can we hear you at the moment? Okay, um, can you so hear me? Martin, what are your thoughts on uh, the, the interaction? Yeah, As yes, I think that... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised at the number of maybes, but that's probably because uh, that's the right answer. Um, yes, I think it's about, it's about the outcomes and the outputs. Hey, Graham, I think you were talking then. Right. Unfortunately, everyone, we seem to uh, not be able to hear you. Can you hear me now? I can certainly hear you, Graham. I can certainly hear you. Well. Hopefully, we'll be able to sort it in a moment. Uh, okay. I think we're okay. all back online now. So, uh, so Graham, okay. you were just talking then. So, yeah, I was just saying, I think this is a bit of a misnomer because um, when everyone was talking about using self-service channels, everyone thought that average handling time um, should go down. And I think this is actually the counterintuitive understanding is that if you're using self-service channels and people are able to actually complete a self-service session, those people that do need to actually connect to an agent should have a higher complexity of inquiry or problem or, or that needs solving. So therefore, you would actually think that AHT in those calls should actually go up. But the quality of those calls would probably be uh, of a higher nature. And that's why I think that um, your, the, quality, the AHT versus you know, whether or not they should be coming through. And if that's the metric, is actually a little bit skewed. Indeed. So we've now uh, going to look at some top tips and questions from the uh, audience. We've got a lot of uh, uh, interaction happening in the chat room. So we'll have a look at the uh, first tip on the similar topic from Paul. So it's focusing uh, uh, on, on only lowering average handling time, pressures agents to not worry about the quality of the contact but the length of the contact. Instead, you should be focusing on individual training. And in a very similar vein, Jane says, we try to focus on the customer experience versus average handling time to move towards first contact resolutions. The calls may be longer, but there's, this reduces callback from our customers. So I, I guess, Martin, yeah. that ties very, in with the, very much in with your, with your point there. Yes, definitely, definitely. And uh, we've got a question in from uh, Annie Esker. Um, uh, which is, what is the best way to measure first contact resolution rates? Um, Martin, I've heard a lot of talk about first contact resolution. I think often um, it's not so much the first contact resolution that's the, 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 is, the, is necessarily the challenge. It's actually reducing repeat contacts. Do you think repeat contacts are probably the best way to do it? I think it is, a, it is a way of doing it. I think every organization is slightly different in terms of how we'd recommend measuring it, and it depends on what systems they've got, how they use their systems. 
Um, but I, I certainly think repeat callers is a, is a good way of, uh, of, of measuring efficiency. Okay, and we've had uh, Lisa has actually answered this question in the chat room. Said we measure first contact resolution with post interaction surveys that are emailed to customers. And um, Graham, I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this. The issues that we've uh, have risen via email is that they're getting our survey, but our answers are, are going to junk. That sounds like there may be a, a setting on the server that's not quite right in terms of. Mm. What what I find interesting though, John, is that people have written first call resolution. And you're talking about first contact resolution. I think there's a bit of a disconnect mm. there because if uh, you know today there are so many channels available, a, a customer may start on a chat or self service and then be forced to move to a call. So that's not really a first contact resolution. That might be a first call resolution, but the customer has actually broken their interactions down and may have an, and each of those channels may have an impact. And that's where we've really got to be careful is looking at those um, interactions by channel not necessarily as a first call. We've had a tip in from Rose. It says, we have a think tank. It's a platform for our employees to feedback or provide ideas on how to improve processes and an employee forum for day-to-day -day ideas on how we can improve their working life. Who better to tell us to improve efficiency and productivity than the agents yourselves? I think, Martin, you'd made a, um, a point about making feedback a two-way a two-way process. Your thoughts on that? Yes, definitely. I think that's really good to hear from, from Rose there. I, I think that's something that we'd certainly support. And again, when we go to poorly performing organisations, one of the things we nearly always introduce is, is some sort of forum to be able to get that input from, from frontline advisors. They, yeah, they know how it is. Yeah, and I think it's also important rather than just putting up the, the, the problems to get the advisor, advisors involved in the solution because that's actually, yeah. you know, a lot of yeah. think tax or stuff, suggestion boxes, it's, it's pretty easy to put up what the problems are, but actually getting mm. ownership and uh, taking those around the organization to get solved can be a lot harder. Mm. Uh, here's a question from Jane. She says, across the globe, how do you train a customer service representative for somebody that doesn't have a strong background in customer service? And I guess this varies uh, from location to location. Don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, yes, I think that certainly from my perspective, I think that, um, that there's something about uh, an attitude and not everybody is right to be in a customer service environment. So I certainly think that first of all, it's making sure you've got the right people that are going to be able to deliver service that um, it's worth investing in the training for and then making sure that, the, that they're, they're capable of doing it. That doesn't necessarily mean to, that they've worked in this environment before delivering customer service. It's really about their, their, their general um, attitude to, to life and their competencies um, and making sure that they, they would be able to do the, the role in the future. Interesting. So let's have a look at uh, a few more of the tips, tips coming in. Sorry, Graham. I was just going to say, you also need to be aware of who your end customer is from a geographical point of view, because uh, where you may be hiring may be quite different from the end customer, and they need to understand that you need to pair that relationship and those cultural uh, identities together so that they work. Because I know, for you know, in Germany, they're very different to us in the in the UK and Ireland. Is that they're very they very much uh, rely on information, and the way that they interact is a lot more formal. Um, if mm. it's even possible to be more formal than the mm. UK, but it is. So you need to make sure you have the right agents paired with the cultures of the customers. We've uh, got a tip in from Laura. It says, focusing on each team member with one-to-one -one catch up and make sure that they're all clear on processes. Certainly um, uh, uh, feedback one-to-ones was a, an item Martin discussed. Uh, here's a tip from uh, Louis. Uh, Luis, who says, uh, keep your survey response rate high by regularly refreshing your questions and keeping them short. And there was another comment on this. Uh, Christopher said, yes, strange but true. This morning I was contacted by a market research company for market feedback on my experience of an insurance company. After answering the questions, the last question was, if I close my eyes, how would the company compare to my vision of the perfect insurance company? I told them the question could not be answered, so the agent cancelled the interview. This is, is then logged as a fault, as failed, when in fact the agent was highly efficient. But because of the rigidity of the survey, it reflects it as failed and therefore not, uh, and not efficient. So agents are often efficient, but the process isn't. Um, mm. 
Martin, you, you know, process was one of the, the key ones you, you, you discussed. Yeah, so I think that's that's a really good uh, good example there from uh, from Christopher. Um, I can't. Yeah, uh, I think that um, it's about understanding exactly what's happening and making sure that when we're measuring performance, that we're taking all aspects into account. So, some agents may appear to be inefficient or unproductive when actually it's the processes or their knowledge of the processes that that's uh, really the issue. Okay, we've got a question in from Marcus about how we uh, grade uh, call quality. Um, Marcus says, what's the best method to use while grading call quality? What techniques should be used to identify trends with regards to the overall customer service in a call center? Certainly, I see a lot of different systems, Graham, in terms of call quality uh, grading, ranging from anything from a, a percentage score, a pass-fail, a traffic-like score. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, look, there's, there's a multiple, I guess it depends if it's a sales call, uh, in, inbound, outbound, or a service. But I think that there is, you know, some companies use uh, colors like, you know, hot, cold, you know, red, green, or, or, uh, or orange. Others use a grading like that or a percentage. I think it really, is a, it really depends on what environment you're in and what actually is easily identifiable to the agent as to what actions need to be taken. There's no point giving a, um, I guess, a score to something that doesn't actually translate into an action, right? Because you can have these milestones, but if it's not clear to the agents what needs to be done afterwards or during the time of that call, then it's just a waste of time. And Martin, percentage calls are quite difficult unless you've got very, very good uh, uh, calibration because different boxes apply to different, different call types. Yes, they do, and I think the the important thing is around looking at what it is you really want to measure. What are the what is the ideal call? What are the composite parts of the ideal call, or contacts? So again, we 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 need to think about the channels as well, and making sure that those individual characteristics. So, for example, the call opening, the call closure, that they're all included in the in that uh, analysis of that uh, that tr uh, transaction to be able to score them effectively. Excellent. Well, before we move on to um... Uh, before we move on to uh, Graham's presentation, Graham's going to be looking at technology, but we're going to ask the question, what technologies are you looking at uh, to deploy to increase uh, productivity? So if just like to uh, vote on those options. So you're looking to deploy live chat, you're looking to deploy chatbots or intelligent assistance, you're looking to uh, put in agent assistance software that helps the agent, you're looking at knowledge base, you're looking at call diversion software. What types of things are you looking to uh, put in your contact center uh, to increase productivity? So you'd just like to uh, vote on that now. We'll have a look at the um, have a look at the answers uh, coming up. Any any thoughts, Graham? What you think will to come top? Um, I would have thought at the moment a lot of people are looking at chatbots or intelligent assistants just because there's so much hype around it. Um, but on the other hand, we know that it hasn't been successful. Um, you wouldn't see a lot, in my opinion, on um, a lot of capital expenditure sort of things like uh, desktops, uh, unified agent desktops, but maybe even in the agent guidance would be something that would be quite large as a percentage. Well, let's have a look at the uh, answers. It looks like 55% of uh, people have said uh, knowledge base, which is um, certainly a key one that you've got to get right before you can look at things like chatbots. Uh, Forty-three percent on uh, looking to deploy live chat, um, followed by uh, agent assistance software. Forty, forty percent. So um, looks like uh, helping agents is certainly a key one, which I think is very good. Uh, Twenty-eight percent chatbots and twenty-one percent call diversion software. So uh, Graham, probably it's a good time now to um, uh, hand the uh, hand the baton across to you, and if you'd like to take us through your ideas of ways that. Uh, technology can help to make the uh, call center more productive and efficient. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, are you able to see my screen? All good? We can indeed. Wonderful. Well, listen, thank you very much. What I'm going to be talking about today is really following on from what Martin had spoken about earlier. And, and there's actually several points that he raised during his presentation that you'll see continuing as a theme in what we're going to talk about today. Before we really get into the crux of it, I really just want to say that now is probably the best time that contact centers have ever been in, in terms of a position to really maximize the usage of technology. 
simply because there are so many out there and the cost has been so prohibitive in the past that that is no longer uh, the situation. So there really is no reason why a contact centre shouldn't be even testing some of these softwares uh, and at least having a go rather than saying, oh, listen, it's too expensive and I'll, I'll wait till it becomes cheaper. The time is actually now, okay? Um, so look, there are a range of ways that, you know, companies are trying to increase efficiencies. And, you know, there's the assisted side, uh, which is really working with the agents, and the secondary side, which is talking about self-service. Now, we're not going to focus on the self-service, but obviously it has a direct impact on uh, on the agents. Very simply, if you look at the statistics, I think there's about, a Gartner and Forrester have said that something like 60% of customers, all, in, all customers, end up in your contact center, despite the fact that you actually have uh, self-service tools. So the more that you can actually um, provide tools to help your agent, the, the better way that they will be to actually answer these questions, okay? What's really imperative, I think, today is because of the amount of software out there is that if you want to get greater efficiencies past the first deployment, is that you want to really looking at uh, how you can automate the deployment from one particular software solution into your back end. If you have to keep doing this every time you deploy a solution, you're not really going to get that economy to scale, okay? Something that came up that I thought was very interesting, I think it was one of your, I think it was Chris uh, mentioned it in one of the tips and also Martin, is that agents are still far too reliant on processes rather than the customer interaction. And so what companies need to really be doing is focusing how they can empower the agent to really focus on the customer by removing those obstacles such as increasing um, automation of mundane and repetitive tasks. Now, to me, before I got into this into this industry, you know, I remember distinctly when I was talking to a telco in Australia about a problem I had that um, the gentleman said to me, the CSO said to me, sir, do you mind if I put you on hold for a minute while I speak to the manager? And I naively, I actually thought that that is what he was doing, when in reality, that person was actually toggling between screens, trying to navigate through many applications and understand what my situation was and what the person could actually do. Now, unfortunately, this is still the reality in a lot of contact centers today. And as Martin pointed out, um, the less empathetic the transaction, uh, the relationship, the greater the chance that the customer will probably walk away, okay? So the benefits are very, very clear about why you should be boosting agent productivity and contact center efficiencies. Now, it does not matter um, who I've spoken to in the past, but all the executives have said, they can't sugarcoat it. The reality is that the key objective is to reduce operational costs while improving customer experience. Um, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Now, that's a really big thing to achieve, but yet there are many levers that one can actually pull to try and uh, achieve that. And if you go back to that other slide, there are multiple solutions out there in the marketplace. And some of these key metrics might be reducing AHT, as people have said. It could be giving a consolidated view of the customer, increasing automation, um, and also things like streamlining agent training to help minimize attrition. We won't delve too much into the self-service because maybe that's uh, for another discussion. Um, so one of the solutions that's available and has been around for many years, but again, isn't being utilized enough, is the idea of a unified agent desktop. Too many of the contact centers see this environment, which means that an agent has to sign into multiple applications, they need to learn how to use them, and then also know which process. So in this particular situation, I have to go to one, number three, number four, number two, in order to complete something. When if you had a single layer like this, a unified agent desktop, you can then see everything in one particular screen. And in today's uh, market, I guess, you know, you can get these very much customizable to the point where it's not just customizable by a company, but also by agent. So as Martin was explaining earlier, you might train an agent in one area such as uh, the phone, but then another one in live chat. They don't need to have access to all of these channels on their view, okay? If you couple that with something like agent desktop automation, that also helps to relieve the agent of having to do those mundane and repetitive tasks that again, take them away from focusing on the customer, okay? And this should be done in the background. In, if you have to explain this very simply, it's taking out the clicks and the mouse movements in the background so that they can actually focus on it, uh, the interaction. And that has very simple consequences for the business. Increasing the, uh, the speed of the service, reducing AHT, reducing the after-call work if it's automated. Also, it increases the accuracy. 
instead of having to copy and paste between different screens or manually writing it in multiple screens, you're going to reduce those errors. And of course, all this results in improved customer experience. If you were to deploy these sort of solutions, this is probably the what I would expect a company to sort of see as the, the results. So this isn't um, specific to one customer, this is sort of the general things that people should be looking at. So you should be seeing around a 50% decrease in your escalation of calls from first to, to second level support. You should see a 30% increase in your FCR. We're not talking about a 30% increase, a 30% FCR rate, we're talking about a 30% increase and about a 20% reduction in your AHT. Again, it depends on the complexity of what you're talking about. I really want to spend a moment to talk about this number, the 30% reduction in age and training time. And again, this comes back to something that Martin was speaking about earlier. Training and onboarding of new agents is complex, both from a systems, from a product perspective, and then when you throw in their agent expect, uh, sorry, customer expectations of the agent, you can understand why uh, turnover in the industry is relatively high. I think when we were talking recently, John, you said it was the latest statistic shows about 30% of agent turnover every year, which it has a very significant impact on the bottom line. So if you can give them the tools to speed up that training and their confidence to start dealing with customers, the sooner they can actually be adding to the bottom line. And if you come back to that one slide that Martin had, which showed about the blended agents, it talked about email, phone, social media, and I think there was one chat. more chat. Yep. There you go. Help, thank you for helping me out. You know, <laughs> that is all about work, uh, workforce management and, uh, and load. The more that you can assist those agents that spend more time in that blended area, the more efficiency you're going to get out of your, your agents. And that brings us to, I guess, one of the easiest, and I think this correlates to one of the polling questions, which is about agent guidance. Now, agent guidance used to have a really bad stigma about it because the words that people used to talk about was agent scripting. And scripting is a, was very, very static. It wasn't real time. And it had a really bad notion of, I'm just reading a sheet of paper. Whereas with technology available, it's not like that at all. It's all about now an interactive and intuitive guidance so agents know what to say and when to say it, okay? And so a good example of this would be, in, you know, McDonald's is a good example of the scripted way. You've ordered a burger, so you've ordered a burger, would you like fries with that? They know exactly what to say and it's, they say it to every single person. Whereas if you and Jonty were going online or you're talking to someone on the phone and say, listen, uh, I'd like to buy that punching bag, get a, beat out a bit of frustration, you know, they might have statistics that show that, you know, 80% of people call in two weeks' time and say, oh, I actually need to buy some boxing gloves. So, listen, if you buy it now, I can actually uh, give you free delivery at a 20% discount. So, that's real-time information available to that customer at the right time should lead to either increased conversion of uh, sales. In some cases, we've seen 2 to 3%, or it'll increase the customer satisfaction because they know that you're looking after their interest long-term. This third point... I think is really one of the most important points, and it came up also in what Martin was talking about. The whole aim of increasing efficiency should be at the hands of the contact center operational specialist. No longer should you be reliant on IT. Traditionally, you would uh, take a ticket with IT, and they would come back to you and say, listen, it's gonna do, uh, we have to do uh, an effort assessment, how long it's gonna take, and uh, we'll come back with a cost. <clears throat> And to some extent, that would dictate whether or not you would be able to make those changes. And by the time you actually get an answer for this, real time was like months ago. So the whole point is that today's technologies are all real time based. And if you can have it in a way that allows, I guess you'll hear the term business owned and IT governed, and you have drop and drag facility on those solutions, the more those people in the know, which is your agents and your operational specialists, can drive those. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm the, probably the least uh, technical person you'll ever meet. Uh, I explain to people that I know that my car has six wheels in it. So, Jonty, maybe if uh, someone can be the first to answer that, we should give them some chocolate. <laughs> but, um, you know, if, if you're a little bit more technical than I am, then you'll be able to pick up a lot of these softwares, you know, significantly faster. Uh, the benefits speak for themselves. So I won't dwell on this too much other than the fact that you know that your CX will go up the lack of needing to repeat customer information, which is a major frustration uh, and improvements on FTRs and uh, not needing to call back later. Uh, from a business perspective, again, we talked about reducing agent um, training time. 
We've seen some companies, there's a, a UK telco that we work with, that has seen them drop their onboarding from five weeks to two and a half weeks. Now, when you consider you might have hundreds of agents starting every year, the significance of that bottom line impact is absolutely huge. Um, one thing that I think resonates really well with uh, people who work in very sophisticated and highly regulated industries such as banking, finance and insurance will find that they're also very worried about um, dis disclaimers and the like. So knowing that they've gone through the right process and ticked that off will also cover themselves um, in case there's an issue later on. Lastly, and I think this is one of the things that hasn't been spoken about enough when we talk about new technologies, the industry is bot crazy and has been for some time. And as I said earlier, the reality is that bots on a customer facing interaction have not met the customer experience uh, levels at all. And so people have been a little bit shy of it. But what people haven't been looking at is their, uh, their little relative, which is the agent personal assistant. Um, and this is actually working side by side doing the processing, the automation and processing uh, in the background to allow the agent to actually uh, come up with a live answer in real time. We liken this to a digital helper that's sitting side by side you. And this helps with things like immediacy of, um, of responses, being able to, I guess, search through databases in the background to get answers that would otherwise take a long time. And in a way, it's like having a, a supervisor sitting next to you. Now, um, I think that the best way and a, and a good way to really explain this further John T is for us to actually introduce uh, my friend Bob. So if you wouldn't mind uh, making some introductions, that'd be great. So you know, John T, I think that that video really drives home that pro that uh, that idea of making automating the really run mundane and repetitive tasks that allow the agent to really focus on the customer. The more that we can empower those customers customers, the agents rather, to do that interaction and really focus on the empathy, the greater the service that we can provide and you'll see those scores go up, which ultimately leads to better line, uh, bottom line um, revenues. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Graham. Some uh, real food for, for thought there. Uh, certainly, you know, some key, uh, key advice. Look to improve the agent desktop. Um, don't get held back by IT. Um, uh, look at uh, deploying technologies where the business can improve it yourself. And uh, Graham, to your uh, point about six wheels, it certainly got me stumped. Uh, Luis has uh, come up with a, a, a theory, which is that uh, it's uh, four wheels plus a, sw a, a spare wheel plus a steering wheel. So I don't know if that was the uh, answer you were looking That's for. That's five, and the sixth one is in your hand. Uh, four wheel, uh, uh, yes, yeah, steering wheel, a spare wheel, and four wheels. So I think yeah, Luis there got you that go. one. That's it. Uh, well done, Louis. So uh, that's certainly had me stumped. So uh, we've got time for, uh, and certainly if anyone wants a demonstration of uh, Bob, the agent assistant uh, software, if you'd like to leave that in the chat room when we leave the webinar. So let's have a look at some top tips and questions from the audience. We've got a few questions that have uh, come through. Jonathan has said, with regards to multi-skilling agents to respond to multi-channels, should you implement or identify, uh, identify anything at recruitment? or concentrate on in-house training. So um, Martin, I don't know if you've got any, any thoughts on this. Yes, I, um, I think I understand the question, Jonathan. I, I would um, always recommend having in-house training. And the reason being is you want to be able to train in your brand values and your standards. So although somebody may well be coming with certain skills, you want to be able to make sure those skills are appropriately applied for your organization and to, to present your brand. Excellent, Graham, I don't know if you've got any thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I guess if you've got like a, a leader or someone who's gone through it, they generally know the best tips on, on how to train someone because you can have a manual or an external person talk to you about how to use that software. But unless you're, again, it comes down to that frontline experience, that's the most valuable. And I guess the, the other thing is not all people are going to be suited for multi-channel. Some people are great at yeah. chatting. Uh, we certainly probably have more than our share of dyslexic people uh, who've got into the uh, into the, what they thought was a call center because they could chat to people. And as long as they can do some basic data entry, that'd be fine. Suddenly expecting them to know grammar and spelling and things such as yeah. that may not be uh, suitable for them. And if we put them in that role, we may find they leave and move on. So 
I think mm -hmm. you know almost ask for volunteers before you uh, before you do that. Don't necessarily enforce that. Um, let's have a look at uh, another um, uh, another question coming through. This is one from uh, Christine. Christina says, "What uh, do you think should be the benchmark efficiency rate to use for talk time versus idle wait time? Uh, the percentage for an advisor." Um, Martin, I've got some thoughts on this. I don't know if you've got any any ideas. <laughs> Yes, again, I think it's quite a, an individual thing, but um, if you were to say um, talk time uh, versus idle wait time, if you were to say somewhere between 65 and 75 percent, then that, that would have been um, considered appropriate. Um, but I do think it depends very much on what the content of each inquiry is around and the, the complexity of it. And the, I suppose the the impact that it has on the, the advisor. So if it's a very simple inquiry, then perhaps you could increase those. Um, but if it's a more uh, sensitive uh, inquiry, then maybe you need to, uh, to reduce it. Certainly, I think uh, some of the things here is that the, uh, that percentage rate is often governed by the amount of traffic you've got on the system and your service levels. And if you want to keep uh, service levels, particularly if call volumes are low, then that will be naturally low, and that's not a bad a bad problem. The one thing we see in a lot of um, people doing Erlang calculations is they don't factor in a maximum occupancy and certainly uh, that really shouldn't go above uh, really much over 85% or unless it's a very transactional center, possibly 90%. Uh, and if you try and push it higher than that, what you'll actually find is that you'll get agent burnout and uh, your, uh, you'll actually will get that uh, um, occupancy, uh, sorry, the um, availability will be, uh, maximum occupancy, mm. will be reflected in longer average handling times. As people get yeah. more burnt, they'll take longer to handle. Yeah. handle. Uh, unfortunately, that's the, uh, all the time that we've got for today. If you'd like to uh, fill in the, uh, web, uh, the, the survey when you leave the uh, uh, webinar today, it's only four questions long. And if you'd like a demonstration of uh, Bob the Bot, the Agent Assist, uh, software, please uh, fill that in in the post call webinar survey. If you would like to uh, get a, a copy of the slides, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinar. Let's have a look at the uh, winning tip today. And that was the tip we uh, mentioned earlier from Jane that said try to focus on the customer experience versus average handling time to, uh, to increase first contact resolution. The calls may be longer, but the reduces customer callbacks will be more productive in the long run. We're going to be back in uh, three weeks' time when we're looking at our 200th webinar, How to Be World Class at Customer Service, and I'd like to thank our two speakers. Uh, thank you, Martin Duke, for joining us today. Thank you very much, John T. Very enjoyable. And thank you to uh, Graham Gilovitz for joining us as well. Thank you very much, Graham. No problems. I hope I get a call back like Martin did. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, thanks very much, and uh, we'll uh, enjoy your Easter break. And we'll see you back in three weeks' time. Thank you then. Bye-bye.